Well, hello everybody. I am back. I'm intact. Uh, got a shiner. Got a cut above my eye. But I look much better than I did last week. In case you missed it, we didn't do a video last week because uh, me <laughs> took a header off my bicycle and I landed face first on the um, on the concrete and uh, messed myself up. It was really ugly last week. So we just decided not to do it. We'll show you. These are the glasses I was wearing. Uh, I was wearing a helmet too. I was wearing a helmet. Um, these are the glasses and you can see where I landed on my, well, my right eye is exactly where we scuffed along the concrete there. So anyway, uh, but I'm back and I'm fine. And uh, I do have a couple of little bumps and bruises, but it's not unpresentable, I don't think. We're going to keep doing the video anyway. One of the things about this weird job about uh, writing about movies is that in order to write about them, you have to watch them. And you have to watch a lot of movies, I think. I mean, to really... Um, build up the acumen and to have a solid base to write about something as large um, as uh, movies in, you know, <laughs> and we all have gaps. I mean, I was talking to a film professor who will remain nameless a few months ago, and I was surprised that you, because we were in discussion. I asked him about a particular movie and said, well, you can talk to speak to this. And he says, well, no, I can't. I have actually never seen that, which in a way is very refreshing and takes a little bit of courage because though we all have these gaps in our expertise and things we have not seen, movies we don't know very well or don't know at all or have never heard of, uh, we're not, you know, it's sort of like we're, we're, we want to present the, this sort of, you know, uh, preternatural uh, level of, um, of of familiarity with these things. It's I was doing a radio hit last week on on Friday, um, and Westmore asked me about this new Nick Cage movie, Pig, which is coming out, which I actually have read about, but I hadn't wasn't thinking about it. And apparently, he had seen this. He had seen a trailer for it, and was quoting from the trailer and. Uh, I was caught in this thing where, you know, do I bluff my way through and or do I just say admit, hey, I don't know what you're talking about. And luckily I said, I don't know what you're talking about because I didn't. Though when he when he gives me a quote and the quote was like, where's my pig? That sounds like a quote that I should know. That sounds like, you know, maybe it should be from Deliverance or something like that. But. In any case, my mind doesn't work that way. My mind is not, I'm not somebody who has a whole lot of movie quotes at my disposal. You know, I just don't think about these things that way. Um, but, you know, it's, my, my big come around point is, is that uh, to pretend to be a movie critic, to be a film critic, you at least have to know a little bit about the movies and the only way to know about the movies is to watch a bunch of movies and one of the projects that we've been embarking on during this pandemic and the early post pandemic if that's what we're in now and I'm not sure it's what we're in but we're, we're watching a lot more movies than than we might normally do in a different uh, situation We've been making a point of going through the old DVD collection coming out and watching something that, um, that you know, we hadn't watched in a long time or maybe we've never watched but we've heard about. One of those films that uh, I hadn't watched for a long time and I thought I knew about. And to, to, to be fair to myself, I did know about. But uh, watching it again was um, not a revelation, but it was uh, really interesting. 
was Red River. And Red River has sort of like been on the periphery of a lot of things we talked about. When I talked about the last picture show, that is the movie that is showing as the last picture show in the in the book and the film. Uh, and in the film, they actually show the iconic uh, move them out scene where all the cowboys are going, yee-haw, moving the, the fo- Now, here's the thing about Red River when I watched it again because I watched it as a kid you know TV I'm sure it was a TV thing TV experience I don't think I've ever seen it in the theater Uh, John Wayne movie uh, Montgomery Cliff is in it and it's his first film even though he he filmed another film after it and it came out before Red River Red River was actually filmed in 1946 Uh, it came out in 1948 which is the same year that uh, My Darling Clementine came out, and I think it's two years before The Gunfighter came out, which are two more movies that we've recently watched of this era. So what I want to say about Red River is that it's not a great movie, and the reasons it's not a great movie is it has to do with the writing and the ending and the way it treats female characters, which is risible, um, a lot of people know about the um, the gay subtext uh, to it, uh, Monty Cliff and uh, the wonderful John Ireland and as Cherry Valance uh, and the, the the scene where they admire each other's guns and you know Cherry says there's only two things better than a good gun and that's a Swiss watch, a woman from anywhere, and then he looks at. Uh, Matt, who is uh, Montgomery Cliff's character, and says, ever, ever had a Swiss watch? Yeah. Okay. But anyway, that's that's a scene that's been pulled out. It's in the 1995 uh, documentary, The Celluloid Closet, which if you haven't seen I would recommend you go see that. Uh, maybe I should put a list down here, the bottom of, of, of films that you ought to go see. I don't know. But anyway, we're... Uh, the thing that strikes me about uh, Red River watching it again, I don't know, 30, 40 years since the last time I've seen it, maybe longer since I've seen it, is how modern Cliff, Montgomery Cliff's performances is, is, is in it. And it's stuck in there, not ungracefully, but it's, it's sort of jammed in there with this sort of, you know, iconic western bravado of John Wayne and the, the you know, aw shucksy kind of Walter Brennan um, portrayal and all these, you know, cowboys who are more or less caricatures. But Mon- Monty Cliff comes in there and he's he's a different kind of actor. You know, in, in his method, you know, he was one of the first actors trained at Lee Strasberg's uh, actor studio. Uh, it's really different in this it's 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 nuanced and subdued it's not like james dean in rebel without a cause which is if you watch it today a pretty kind of overheated performance uh, it's you know he's not going you know he's not emoting like that he's it's very tight very low key very suppressed very psychological very, very modern sort of performance that we get from Montgomery Cliff in this movie. Um, even when he says dumb lines, they come off as, you know, things that are just being tossed off offhand or, yeah. It's, it's, it, it, and he looks like Tom Cruise. I never realized that. You know, because you know the myth of Montgomery Cliff, you know, the Montgomery Cliff you know comes out of Omaha Nebraska he's this beautiful kid he goes to Hollywood he doesn't sign a contract but he gets into movies and he makes two movies before he signs a contract because he gets the leverage from you know because well Red River was a hit made him a star you know so now he's got you know some some juice then 1956 comes way too quick and he's leaving Elizabeth Taylor's house maybe he's drunk maybe he's on pills but maybe he shouldn't be driving he slams his car into a tree right outside the property um, allegedly 
you know, there's photographers there because it's Elizabeth Taylor's house and there's, you know, a party going on. And then allegedly Liz, Elizabeth Taylor comes out and says, tells these guys, if you take a picture of Monty in this condition, in this banged up condition, you'll never take another picture of me. So they respected her and respected that threat and didn't take any pictures of Monty Cliff when he was all busted up and stuff like that. Now, when he returns, and he was making Rain Tree County at the time, if you watch Rain Tree County, and you can definitely tell the, the before and the after on Monty Cliff. I mean, because afterwards his left side is paralyzed kind of, and he's, his features are messed up. He's wonked up a little bit. Um, it's kind of a dramatic... It is, it's sort of odd that they went ahead and finished the film, you know, with because he looks so different. And the rest of his career, he looked different. He, he was a different type of actor, and he wasn't in as much demand. And the pain, and maybe there were some previous predilections, who knows. Uh, the pain uh, led him to, to, you know, to, to uh, treat himself with... Uh, to self-medicate with drugs and alcohol and by 1966 he's dead of a heart attack you know and he's pretty much forgotten pretty much unemployable at the end and it's sad you know I think the last thing his, his last words were he had a nurse and the nurse came up and you know said hey the misfits is on you want to come watch it with me and Monty Cliff shouts no from the bathtub and that's the end of Monty Cliff he finds him later dead of a heart attack brought on by all these other conditions but you know you think you know something I mean so you're, so if I was going to list the iconic westerns you know stagecoach would be one the searchers would be one uh, I would I would always put the gunfighter in there even though it's a a, a less well-known film uh, Rio Bravo is one I'd put in there and I'd put Red River in there, but I always would have thought Red River is kind of the squarest and maybe the um, the most boring of them, because the, the, the one that had the least weird stuff in it, but it's not. It's got a lot of weird stuff in it. Um, the whole attitude toward women is so interesting, especially if you look at it you know, from the point of view of uh, you know the modern modern viewer and what we know about Monty Cliff's private life or think we know about Monty Cliff's private life and you know what we might or may not suspect about John Wayne if you read James Elroy's uh, books um, <laughs> but you know it's sort of like it's sort of like a girls haters club I mean it's sort of really weird in the beginning when uh, it starts off you know, John Wayne is part of a, he joined up with this wagon train in St. Louis and they're going to California and he just joined up with him and he's riding along with him and apparently he's, uh, you know, made friends with this woman, uh, Finn, on, while he's on his way to uh, California with him. Well, they get to Oklahoma and all of a sudden John Wayne decides, I want to go to Texas and start a cattle ranch and I'm leaving. I'm going right now. I'm leaving the, the um, wagon train. And the wagon train people don't want him to leave because he's, he's John Wayne. He's another gun. He's another, you know, he's, the bigger these trains are, the safer they are, or, you know, the more people they have. They don't want him to leave. And he makes a point of saying, I did not sign on. I just joined on. I just came along. And I'm just leaving now because that's the way it is. And uh, as he's leaving, his, uh, I forget who plays her, um, Finn comes out and says, take me with you. I want to go with you. You need someone out there those long nights on the prairie. <laughs> you, know? you need, and he dismisses her. And he just dismisses her. It's like, no, go to California. I'll send for you when I'm ready. Okay. John Wayne. And John Wayne and Walter Brennan take off together. And Walter Brennan has a wonderful line where he's explaining to the head of the wagon train, like, well, me and Tom, it's, it's me and Tom, me and Mr. Dunst, me and Tom Dunstan. Yeah, it's like, you know, it's like we're, we're just together, you know. <laughs> we're together. <laughs> and so they go off. And that night, as they're 
leaving the wagon train and they can see the smoke and they can see that there's been an attack on the wagon train and uh, Walter Brennan points it out and John Wayne looks over at the wagon train or where the smoke's coming from and he goes you know we could go back it's really not that far but nah they don't go back they don't go back and then later that night they're attacked and then John Wayne gets in this fight with this uh, Indian brave uh, hand to hand and he kills him and when he kills him he notices that on his left wrist there is a bracelet his mother's bracelet that he gave Finn so he kills the guy who presumably killed his fiance and this bracelet makes this really interesting journey throughout the movie okay the next day, they find uh, the 13-year-old kid who's, I forgot who played him. He's really good, though, the kid who plays him. Um, this kind of crazy-eyed, wild kid who survived the wagon train's massacre and is wandering around with his cow, which, you know, and Walter Brennan and John Wayne are wandering around with a steer. So uh, they basically adopt this kid who grows up to be Montgomery Cliff. They go down to, you know, someplace in Texas, and they keep going south to find a place they like. Uh, these emissaries from Don Diego in Mexico come up to him and say, hey, you know, amigo, you can stay here. It's all cool. But, you know, this is Don Diego's land, and you got to move on after, you know, a night or so. And John Wayne goes, well, how much, you know, Where's Don Diego? She goes, oh, he's across the Rio Grande. And John Wayne goes, well, tell Don Diego that all the land south of, the, south of here and north of the Rio Grande belongs to me, Tom Dunstan. And then he goes into this little thing about, well, how he, he just took it from somebody. He just took it from, you know, the Indians probably. So I'm just taking it from him. And this causes a gunfight where he kills one of the emissaries. He tells the other one to go back, tell Don Diego all this stuff. We'll kick your him, we'll bury him, and say some words over it. Okay. Flash forward 14 years. And it's 1866. It is the end of the Civil War. Um, Dunstan, John Wayne, has established this huge cattle ranch. And he has a bunch of stereotypical, you know... Cowboys working for them. You can tell them all apart by their hats. They all have different distinctive hats. And there's an Irish guy who's wearing a derby. And I never could figure out exactly what actor played that Irish guy. But he's, you know, you, you, you know them, you will know them by their headwear. Anyway, that's how they decided to identify him. So you can tell who's, and it's Noah Beery Jr. And there's Harry Carey Jr. And, you know, it's, it's, you know, look at it. It's like, this is an expensive movie already. Um, there's a scene where they take the camera and they it's a corral and they go around in a circle. And you just get this whole sense that John Wayne is being surrounded by this sea of cattle. But what they actually did was they took the camera and they put it on a, on a you know, like a lazy season, whatever they use, they, something in went from fence post to fence post and they stopped moved the cattle over here so and then they filmed the cattle again went to the next fence post stopped moved the cattle did the thing again all the way around so you get 360 degrees it's all the same cattle it's all the same cattle but it makes it look like there's a huge in which is like he's he's you know, supposedly has 9,000 head of cattle that he's decided he's going to drive to Missouri to market because the price of beef is just, the floor's fallen out of the price of beef in Texas and uh, something to do with the carpetbaggers. <laughs> they would come back and, and, and a lot of the cowboys have just returned from fighting the war. And Matt has just come back. Now Matt is Montgomery Cliff, and he's just come back from school. I believe it's school. Let's say it's school. Not, 
I used to think that he had just come back from the war, too, but I don't know. It doesn't really make a whole lot of sense because now he's, you know, he's mid-20s. You know, if he was 13, you know, 14 years before, he's now 27, so it's something like that. I mean, maybe he was supposed to be younger. I don't know, but you know, I'm, I'm thinking he's 25 to 27 years old, so he's coming back, and maybe he's been to college. I don't know. Maybe he's been back east studying Shakespeare. I don't know. But anyway, he comes back, and he's just in time to help with the cattle drive to Missouri. And they make a point of this. This is kind of like, this is just the way Tom Dunstan slash John Wayne rolls. He's not being real, real careful about whose cattle he's got there. And so he's confronted by these other cattle owners, his neighbors, uh, one of them who has Cherry Valance, the hired gun, alongside him. And when he's pressed, Tunstan says, well, you know, guys, yes, I do have some of your cattle mixed in here. I, I do. And I have been changing some of your brands to my brand. But I promise when I get to, when I get to Missouri, when I get to Kansas City or wherever I'm going, I'm going we will sort it out and I will pay you a fair price for, for your cattle. And that seems to assuage everybody. And Cherry Valance no longer wants to kill um, John Wayne. Uh, he now wants to join him and because it looks like it'll be exciting to go on the cattle drive, so he wants to join him. And he also really is interested in Matt. And that leads to the famous scene where they're walking along comparing firearms and talking about Swiss watches and shooting at things and trading guns. And it's just kind of... you. There's no doubt they knew exactly what they were doing in 1946. Anyway, so, they go on the cattle drive. Then it becomes meeting on the banner because John Wayne becomes Captain Bly, basically. And at the end of, of when he really gets out of it, and he's, we go through all these terrible things. You know, it's like they, and there's a wonderful scene where they're crossing the Red River, which is not crossing the Red River. It's crossing some creek someplace in Arizona because they filmed it around Tucson, Elgin, Arizona. They did not film it in north central Texas, which would have looked very different, just like they didn't film True Grit in Darnell, Arkansas, which would have looked very different. Um, there's a spectacular scene where they're actually, you know, driving cattle across the, um, the, the river. And, you know, it's like instead of, sitting back with the cameras on the bluff and watching this magnificent thing just roll over. What Hawks does, what Howard Hawks, the director, does, is put you right down in the middle of it, and he puts a camera, like, right behind Walter Brennan as he's driving the truck wagon over. And it's really interesting because you're, you're really down there close, and if you're watching the Criterion Blu-ray on a good setup now, the, the, the difference between... the it sometimes looks like this really sharp, you know, almost video look to it, and other times it's just a softer kind of grainy film look, and it's fascinating to see how it changes because it depends on which camera they're using and where it is and how far away they are and all that, but it's, and from a technical point of view, it's just really cool to watch this. And you see things that maybe you shouldn't see, like you see a, a horse defecating at one point in the in the river, which I had not noticed that, and I'm sure that it didn't get noticed when, you know, when they were assembling the film, but, you know, I'm sure many people have noticed it since. I have not Googled it, though I will as soon as I get off this video. Uh, anyway, so John Wayne becomes a tyrant. Uh, they basically, they do the Western equivalent of putting him in a lifeboat with some water and sending him off adrift. They give him two horses, take his guns, and they, bye-bye, Dunstan, we're going to go. And now we're not going to go to Missouri where the bandits are and all this. We're going to go to Abilene, Kansas, where there's a rumor of a railroad, which will take our stock to market if it exists. If it doesn't exist, we don't know what we're going to do. We'll be in Kansas and we'll be, you know, wandering around with a bunch of cows, with a bunch of beeves. But, you know, we're, it's better than going to Missouri, which seems like certain death, because 
those raiders or border raiders are there and they're, they're killing everybody and they're worse than the Indians we're going to have to face this way. So anyway, back to the bracelet, which Matt has been wearing now. He's been wearing the bracelet that John Wayne got from his mother to give to his, well, his wife, his new wife, which whenever he got married and gave it to his fiance for a while. But now Matt's wearing it. Yeah. Make of that what you will. Uh, Matt, uh, they find, before they get to Abilene, they, they run into this other wagon train, which is of show people, of uh, casino people and dance hall people from New Orleans who are going somewhere. <laughs> I don't know. They're going west. And uh, Matt gets there just in time to help them out with this Indian attack. And it's one of the most ludicrous scenes I've ever seen in a, you know, a, a a Western that aspires to be an epic, to be an American epic. There's, you know, some of this, I mean, you can compare Red River to the Odyssey. You know, it's like this big journey that these men are making. It's going to, it takes 60 days. But, you know, they pretend it's this huge film and it's just got the serious aspirations. And then you're fighting Indians in this, you know, they're circling the wagons and their Indians are shooting arrows and and they're firing back at him, and and Matt is flirting with this woman, Tess, Joanne Drew, who plays this dance hall girl. And it's a very strange conversation because she's just a motor mouth, which is an actually, actually an interesting plot point, an actual interesting character point, because she obviously is very nervous, and that's why she has to talk all the time. So she's talking, da, 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 da. and he's kind of annoyed with her, but he's also obviously attracted to her, and he thinks she's a prostitute, which she very well could be, though she kind of denies it. Anyway, after they run the, okay, before before that, Anyway, at one point, this arrow comes, goes, Shoo! it's in her shoulder. And she's looking at her. Look, what happened to me? Yeah. And it's like, no big deal. He just goes over there and just, like, you know, tends to the shoulder. And then he pulls her and kisses it. And, you know, and then they spend the night together and he's gone. And two weeks later, when Dunstan shows up and runs into the, um, wagon train she's wearing the bracelet then I gotta wrap this up quick then you know they get to Abilene the, the, the cattle drive does and they, there, there is a railroad and Harry Carey Sr. is there to offer like an incredible price for the cattle 20 bucks a head as opposed to the two dollars at 21 bucks a head actually of what it comes out to as opposed to the two dollars a head they were hoping to get in Missouri and you know but but Dunson shows up just as all this is going down and he means to kill Matt because Matt took away his cattle and you know his command and all this stuff so he runs into camp he's got his henchmen now but he runs into camp, determined to shoot him, and he runs into Cherry, and Cherry, you know, says, where are you guys? Draws on him. Uh, they both shoot. Uh, John Wayne gets wounded. Cherry crumples to the ground. We don't really know how bad he's wounded. And then he goes after Matt, and he runs up to Matt, and Matt just stands there, just stands there stoically as John Wayne shoots all around him. And John Wayne can't provoke him to draw. He's mad. Uh, so he uh, said, you never took, he told me, never take your gun away from me. He reaches out, grabs his gun, and then he hits him. And when he hits him, finally, that's when, you know, Matt breaks and he fights with John Wayne, which is an incredible mismatch. It's like, John Wayne, Monty Cliff. But, you know, it's even in the movie, you know, so then, and then, Tess runs in as they're fighting and says, you guys need to cut it out or get a room, in effect. We know you love each other. Block it. And they stop. 
and they laugh. And John Wayne goes, hey, buddy, you got to marry that one. And you're going, what? And Sherry is bleeding out in the dirt over here. Um, Consolation Prize, John Ireland, who plays Sherry, gets to marry Joanne Drew, who Howard Hawks, the director, was putting the make on all through the production, and which probably led to Hawks cutting some of John Ireland's part, but never mind. So this is my Red River summary, and it is a bizarro movie if you look at it through this lens. Anyway, then they go back to Texas, presumably, they, and, and Matt becomes a full partner in the cattle ranch, and Tess marries Matt. And Tess's promise to bear John Wayne a son, I guess, gets lost. I don't know what happens with that. But anyway, it's a crazy film. It's the most American film ever. Because it's got all this weird stuff about manifest destiny and race and sexual politics and sexual identity and all this stuff. And it's glorious, glorious black and white. So, you know, these are the sort of things you think about when you go to the movies. At least sort of things I think about when I go to the movies. I've spoken for half an hour. I'm going to let it go with that. We'll see you next week. And I'll be better. <laughs>